so, um, so how should we think about this? So you usually you have THH with um, coefficients in uh, by module P, and uh, so then you have P, and then you tensor P with itself circle worth of ace from both sides. Now what do you do? So when n is equal to 3, for instance, then you put a p here. You put a p at each third root of unity, and you connect them by ace as you think you would. And that gives a nice uh, c3, in this case, um, object. Come back, please. There you are. And that's uh, essentially what I've uh, defined here uh, with un when n is equal to 3. And, uh, well, there are certain... So the restriction map... So if a is equal to p, uh, this is nothing but uh, thh uh, itself. So this is just a bunch of uh, copies of thh itself. And just like we had restriction maps before, we have restriction maps now, and, of course, uh, it goes by division here. And Wn, then, is the homotopy limit of all these fixed points of all the UTs when T is less than or equal to N. And what we've seen so far is the case when we only focus on the prime powers. Uh, but, of course, we can take them all at the same time if we want to. And we do have, just as before, a fundamental cofibration sequence where... Uh, well, here we have what replaces the fixed well the fixed points uh, of uh, topological Hochschild homology to various degrees, but here we recognize uh, the homotopy fiber as THH homotopy orbits under the group in question. <laughs> okay, but that gives us an enormous information about what these functors actually are. And in particular, you just sit down and, and uh, muddle around with your cubes, as you usually do when you're studying uh, Goodwillie calculus. And uh, you see that just as when n is equal to 1, this is linear. Well, when n is not necessarily equal to 1, this becomes n homogeneous. And um, so these become actually the layers of some Taylor tower, and that Taylor tower is exactly the Wn's. So that's just sitting down and seeing that these are um, n polynomial and that these are n homogeneous. Okay, um, so what we should then do is to show that K theory of A with coefficients in something and this W thing with coefficients in something have the same Taylor tower because then I'm fine, then I have that the nth... Um, Pn of k is actually just Wn. And, well, if you know that both of these fellows are, a sick, uh, are a analytic and whatnot, and you have a map between them, which is just the trace, then, uh, well, two functions are, uh, analytic functions are the same if they have the same differentials in some arbitrary small neighborhood. And that's just what we're going to use. Um, we're going to look in a very small neighborhood. We're going to look at the connected uh, fellows. So they are very close to zero, but they're not necessarily equal to zero. And I look at um, what happens when I look at the difference between P plus Q, where Q is awfully small, and P, which is connected. So it's not P is not necessarily zero, but it's, at least it's connected. And then you look at the cor uh, correspondence between K theory and W, and uh, it's the fibers here that we are interested in in order to see the differentials. And by an analysis that is very similar to what you do in uh, the case when P is equal to zero, when you're actually calculating the differential at zero, you see that this map is highly connected. It's, well, if Q here is Q minus, uh, K minus 1 connected, this map is 2k minus 3 connected, and you get that by comparing to some concrete topological Hochschild homology of something. 
Okay, so, uh, so the upshot here is that one way of seeing this is that you show that these two things have the same Taylor Tower by just showing that they have the same differential in a neighborhood. I hope, yeah? Yes, these are, so, uh, so these should be considered as functors in the bi modules, yes. Um, or you could, if you want to take it off spaces at the end. That's, that's your choice. Okay. So, we have these two theories, and we were in the middle of discussing how good an approximation um, TC actually was. Um, let's run, well, let's do a fast forward. So we had that um, they were the same locally. So if you know K theory at one point and you know TC at the same point and another point, then hopefully you will be able to reconstruct K theory at that point. Uh, which is good because <laughs> there, well, there, are, there are ring spectra that are awfully different, but Say, for instance, these all have pi naught equal to the integers, uh, but they're then connected through this sort of analysis. Um, we also had closed excision. Let me not comment on that now. And we were uh, at this stage. By the way, I added some more references because I suddenly uh, realized that I was doing a disservice to some of my young co-authors who, uh, who need some more publicity. Um, okay, so when things are not too far from FP, and this is the case here, you have a connective ring spectrum and pi naught is finitely generated over the bit vectors of a perfect field of characteristic zero, then actually the difference between K theory and topological cyclic homology is, well, according to Lars, this is, uh, uh, well, it's an interesting group, but it sits in degree minus one, so who cares? These two things are the same in positive degrees. Um, so truncating, uh, in, uh, in non-negative degrees, these two things are actually the same. So we do want to calculate um, topological cyclic homology. So that is for everybody who are fairly close to the prime field. Well, let's look at the other side of the story. The way on the other side. Those who are close to the sphere spectrum. Um, so, for instance, uh, spherical group rings, um, Risco talked about uh, interesting group rings yesterday. And, of course, when we were working with um, the sphere spectrum, uh, you sort of think that you know what, um, what this should be. Well, if you just smash the spherical group ring with itself, then you get just get the spherical group ring over the product. And so THH of the spherical group ring is just the suspension spectrum of the cyclic nerve and so forth. But of course, it can be awfully hard even so. Um, this actually um, is sort of contagious. It goes all the way to Tom spectra, um, a sort of twisted version by Blumberg, Cohen, and Slichtkohl. How did Slichtkohl get a C first? I'm sorry about that. That should be an S. Uh, I'll correct that. Um, and so, for instance, THH of MU then is very concretely given by this formula here. And uh, for these sort of spectra, things are even, well, they're extremely nice because you have the Siegel conjecture confirmed here by Luna Nilsson and Rognes in 2011, saying that the fixed points of THH actually are the same as the homotopy fixed points. And this is not only in positive degrees. This is true, period. These two things are the same. So uh, that means that, for instance, if I let n grow here and I take um, the maps being inclusion of fixed points, 
Uh, well, then at the limit, I get THH, the homotopy S1 fixed points. And of course, I have some hope of being able to calculate that. And uh, uh, going to TC now is not that very far. If I just understand the restriction map, then TC is just the difference between uh, the identity and the restriction map on this homotopy fixed set space. And uh, um, so, of course, all of these fellows cohabitate very nicely, and you can compare the results that you get for the sphere spectrum, say for MU and KZ. All of these are... Uh, homotopy Cartesian squares, so you may hope to play these things against each other. So MU is, uh, is fascinating. We knew that. Um, well, the sphere spectrum is all, and, and group rings, of course, are very interesting because the K-theory of spherical group rings, for instance, when you have the loops, uh, loop space of a certain space X, that tells you a lot about uh, concordances and diffeomorphism of manifolds. It splits up into, well, the uh, stable homotopy of X and the so-called white diff spectrum. So this is sort of uh, one of the main reasons some of us are interested in algebraic K-theory at all. We want to understand diffeomorphisms of manifolds. So in the special case when your space is simply connected, then you have a homotopy Cartesian square, and to the extent that we know this, and uh, we will see that we know a lot about this, and uh, the motivic guys tells us that we sort of know this. That sounds very, very promising, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, so, of course, the, one of the problems is that we don't really understand these maps even though we sort of, haha, understand each of uh, the things involved, uh, analyzing the maps can be sort of painful. And also, if we're really after a more uh, refined invariants, we want to understand uh, the involution that uh, is on the algebraic K theory of a space. Uh, Yes, yeah, so, so th that is something that pops up all the time. Um, so whether, uh, what you want to call it, I don't know. But uh, yeah, so, so it's, so, okay, so what is this? This is the THH part. So this is the difference between THH and K-theory. That's this thing here. So you have this a similar thing uh, for, uh, for TC. Okay, but how uh, did the story start? I started off by saying that uh, Buxley, Chang, and Matson wanted to prove the Novikov conjecture, and we've seen things that are quite similar to that in uh, Briscoe's talk yesterday. And uh, what do they prove? They prove that, well, they are considering discrete groups, and the homology should be finite. And then they're considering the assembly map, and they want to show that it is rationally injective. Of course, if they shown it, showed it for L-theory, they would have been showing Novikov's original conjecture. Uh, but this is awesome as well. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and they actually get the K-theory of, a huge chunk of the uh, K-theory of group rings. And um, in hindsight, um, the proof gets easier and easier every day, uh, which, well, is... A true sign that this was a great idea. Um, two things that go into the proof I want to highlight. There's a result by Soleil that says uh, something about how the integers fit in the piadic integers. And then a concrete calculation showing on this TC side that the corresponding assembly map splits after P completion. And that's, well, and then you draw the diagram and then you're uh, I think Holger Reich wrote down a very nice diagram for that. And then you're done. So that was the Novikov conjecture. That was the original um, motivation. came in the late 80s. But already at the same time, uh, Bergstedt and Matson 
saw that this should probably be useful for way more. So they started to do almost the hardest calculation you can imagine. They started to calculate topological cyclic homology of the integers. Um, and um, so if you read the two papers that, uh, that give that calculation, they're just such a source of wonderful ideas. Um, so for one thing, uh, here for TC, you do, do, when you're only interested in p-complete information, it doesn't matter whether you're p-complete on the inside or not. Um, so uh, we go for the simpler, uh, simpler thing. We go for the p-completions. And then we get to back to what Lars talked about, um, namely the comparison between the fixed points and the homotopy fixed points and, well, one lower fixed point and the Tate. So this is, this is slightly different notation from what Lars was using. Um, this is the homotopy fixed point sp uh, spectrum and this is the corresponding Tate spectrum. This is the homotopy orbit spectrum. So this is the fundamental cofibration sequence for THH and this is uh, the corresponding thing for the homotopy fixed points at the Tate. And you have a comparison. And the lower row, of course, you have at least you have lots of spectral sequence. And if you're really good at spectral sequences, perhaps you can say something sensible about what happens there. And then the question is, how close is the top row to the bottom row? And um, so, for instance, for the integers, which uh, Bergstedt and Matz now are interested in, it's fine. It's not a trivial fact, but it's fine. That's actually, in at least in positive degrees, um, that is um, an equivalence. Uh, so that means that uh, they have to start calculating spectral sequences here, and they do. And that spectral sequence becomes very interesting, and it has lots of interesting um, extensions. Um, I'm not going to do that for you, naturally. Uh, but I want to point out that um, one of the extensions is easily seen when we realize that Heslot and Motzen prove that pi naught of the fixed points actually are the bit groups of pi naught of A. A, is, A here is connective. So uh, there are going to be a lot of, uh, lot of stuff that just hinge up on itself in a very interesting way. And this program has, so more or less following the same routine, but of course there, the devil is hidden in all the details, and there are lots of them, uh, for uh, the prime field. So just this, these are just three instances that I wanted to point at. The prime field has thought in Matson and uh, the integers by Berkson and Matson and um, topological K-theory by Rognes and Ausani, um, and... Salidis was, uh, Salidis was uh, crucial here at one point. That is totally, uh, totally right. Salidis uh, was the first one who proved the inductive um, induction steps that makes this tick. So uh, what he showed was that if you know this for n is equal to 1, then you know it for all n's. So yes, thank you. We should not forget that. Um, and that also brings me to, uh, to another point, and that is, so if x here um, is a finite free uh, of Cp to the nth set, um, and I take the smash power of A that number of times, and I look at the difference between the fixed points and the homotopy fixed points, um, Birkstedt, Brunner, Luna Nielsen, and Rognes showed in 2014 that after p completion, this is um, actually an equivalence. Uh, and that also uses Salidis', uh, Salidis um, result. And they prove it that for n is equal to 1. So this is a sort of a Siegel conjecture, but it's only for finite. So e for each, you can think about. about there, so you have the simplicial circle, and they're doing it in each degree, and in each degree it's fine, 
but um, homotopy fixed points do not commute with taking the realization. So um, this does unfortunately not imply that this is always an equivalence, and that's probably good that it's, they didn't prove that. But, um, but I think this is a, is a result to be aware of in this situation. Okay, so homotopy fixed points and fixed points are occasionally very close. And, of course, for A being the sphere spectrum, this is the original Siegel conjecture. Um, okay, so what more should I uh, mention about real cool stuff that has happened um, about calculation? Well, here is one really cool thing that has been going on for quite a while. Um, so now we're closer to understanding K-theory of Zp, because we know Tc, uh, and K-theory of the um, piadics is not that far apart because um, Quill proved that there was a vibration sequence uh, given by the quotient field Fp, Zp, and Qp. So this thing here we can calculate, or we, uh, Quill, could. Uh, and this thing here, people have uh, been good at calculating. So this here is not that uh, far apart. But we're after uh, a bigger picture. We're not necessarily after the piadics, but perhaps we want to change this to some other local uh, field. And the problem is that trace methods are abysmal when it comes to rational stuff, because topological cyclic homology of a rational thing is nothing but the homotopy fi S1 fixed points of Hochschild homology. So uh, it retains exceedingly little information. Yeah? Please do. Yeah, I, I should admit that everything I'm saying after completion at one single prime, and that prime is that prime, but yeah. Yeah, this is a, it's an encouragement for everybody. Please prove that. Either way. <laughs> yeah, I, so, so when I say that we understand this, that's of course a lie. Um. <laughs> okay, but uh, uh, this is not to say that uh, Heslot and Matson had thought very good and deep thoughts about how to attack this and for what they do. They do the following. Okay, so they want to have some sort of localization sequence in topological cyclic homology. And um, so, of course, we have a localization sequence in K-theory. So why don't we just use that localization sequence in K-theory and plug it into TC and hope that something good happens? And uh, what do they do? Essentially, they do that. They consider that a category of bounded complexes of finite projective Z P modules, but the weak equivalences are those that uh, are so that when you rationalize, you get a quasi-isomorphism. And then you have a localization sequence in K-theory, which looks exactly like this, which actually is this thing here, because uh, the K-theory of the piadics is given exactly by the K-theory of this category of bound bounded complexes um, with these weak equivalences. And so they say, let's set... Tc of um, Qp, well, relative to Zp, to be topological cyclic homology of this category. And then they get a localization sequence in Tc as well. So the situation in K-theory is mirrored very nicely in topological cyclic homology. <sighs> okay, so the point of this was not to do uh, Qp, but uh, to move on to more fascinating fields. So 
they consider complete discrete valuation fields of characteristic zero where uh, the residue field has characteristic, I don't know, is P is equal to 2 okay now or no? Nobody knows. Um, so, odd P. And uh, to make a very long and fascinating story short, uh, they attack it through the Durand bit complex with logarithmic poles. So now uh, we don't localize because that throws TC totally off course, uh, but we work with logarithmic poles, which is some sort of mild variant of that. And in that way, they get a full calculation of K theory of these complete discrete valuation field after P completion. And, of course, what is nice is that, well, it confirms um, lichtenbaum quillen conjecture in that particular case. And uh, this goes on uh, for, uh, for other localization pro processes. For instance, if you want to look at um, complex K-theory, you compare it with the connective version of complex K-theory, and then Bloomberg and Mandel study that uh, sequence here, and uh, the residue ring. Then, well, what is so? What happens before? Before I had z p to z p multiplication by p to um, to f p. Now I get um, the bot map from a suspension of k u to k u with residue field, residue ring the integers. So you get a sequence like this and uh, Ausani calculated KU and given a setup like this you see that these calculations actually look very much nicer. They, they're sort of complex. Um, uh, they look nicer when you look at the localization. And that seems to be, well that's similar to what you're seeing here. There's more structure on the K-theory of the localized guy. Okay, so these were some examples of calculations of K-theory that you can make through trace methods. Um, I want also to mention that you can do something slightly less ambitious in that you can try to just detect pieces of K-theory without actually being able to calculate it. And um, this has to do with the redshift conjecture. So uh, lichtenbaum quillen conjecture uh, for number rings essentially said that uh, you had some sort of bot periodicity. Um, so the p minus first power of the bot element, uh, well, it doesn't actu actually, um, it's not invertible because we don't have negative groups to take care of that, but at least it should act as a non-zero divisor. So this is a weak way of thinking at it. Um, and so the redshift conjecture takes this further. So not only, so if you plug in the next step, you should see, be able to see V2 and so forth. And to a certain extent, uh, that actually works out. So here is an example uh, that um, since somebody asked, I'm going to talk a wee bit about. So for now I'm going to talk about some things I'm a wee bit involved in. Uh, and that is the following situation. So you take A to B, well, you take uh, the field with P elements, and you, well, if you take the K theory of that, you get a ring spectrum, and you take the K theory of that, and you take the K theory of that, and you take the K theory of that n times. Um, so ideally, so first time you take K theory, what happens? Well, um, in K naught is the integers. And what happened was that you went from P being zero to P acting injectively. So it's a non-zero divisor, at least it cannot. So uh, something good happens at the start, and what I'm going to tell you now is that that continues next time around. So if I P complete, then I just have the piadics in degree zero, and next time around, lichtenbaum quillen conjecture tells me that V1 is going to be a non-zero divisor. And you keep on going like that. So you study K-theory of K-theory iterated 
as many times as you want. And um, then you discover that um, when you take the nth Morava K theory, which is exactly the device for detecting Vn, so it's uh, the cohomology theory, uh, and it has um, coefficients fp with a polynomial in that periodic class Vn sitting in degree 2 pn minus 2. And, of course, I don't have very much chance of calculating Tc of A when A is this iterated K-theory. But what can I do? I can do the following. And I can go da all the way down to THH of FP. And I can do that n plus 1 times. And each time I do, I have a circle action. So all in all, this will amount to having an entire torus action. And, uh, well, I shouldn't be that ambitious. Perhaps I should take the homotopy fixed points. And it turned out that this map, then, detects these chromatic uh, periodic classes. So that's what I do here. And uh, perhaps I should state here, then, so this is THH of THH of FP, so that is the same as taking the smash over the n plus 1 torus of, well, HFP. And then you have the entire torus, torus action there, and of course you have more action uh, that we just understand to some extent. Okie dokie. Okay, so let's look at that for five seconds. So. Boom. Ha. That worked. Okay, so these are old slides uh, that I just dug up because uh, you asked. Um, okay, so um, the claim is that um, the periodic class here is detected down here. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're, uh, we're not in a position where we can actually calculate the entire uh, homotopy fixed points of Tn, but we can do enough to detect these Vns. Of course, I would love to say that uh, Vn was a non-zero divisor. I can't do that. I'm only telling you that it's non-zero. But still in all, I think that's pretty cool. I can do this for any n. By the way, I should say that for n is less than p, this is due to Vn. And, uh, um, and of course, for n very low, it's due to very many people. Uh, and uh, above that, uh, Ausonia and myself are responsible. So blame us. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, this is uh, a procedure that uh, has been used in many cases. So, uh, and, um, so okay, so I see I have uh, done my n's and n plus 1's sort so sort of off here. I hope you can live with that. Okay, so uh, the homotopy fixed points of uh, a spectrum with a torus action is nothing but the equivariant maps from um, ET n plus 2x. Uh, so if you replace uh, ET by its two skeleton, uh, then we have something that is way more manageable where we can actually do some calculations. And the fun thing is that, um, well, the two skeleton, of course, is, uh, is fairly easy to build. And we have then a cofiber sequence. Here is um, this space here, which I just called M, which is strong enough to detect Vn. And it's built, well, it, the letter B here is to commemorate con, con's B map. So in the case N is equal to 1, 
um, then uh, this thing here would be exactly the fiber of the B map. And in that case, it would go between X and a suspension of X itself. But since we're multivariable, uh, there are N copies of X sitting there. So we can actually calculate uh, M if we understand this B map. Yeah, so let's do that. Um, okay, here goes. And I see that there are the n's and n plus ones have been mixed. I'm sorry about that. I hope, again, you can live with it. So I want to detect Vn. It's not hard. Uh, so H here, in order to have such a huge diagram, I had to simplify a bit. H is HFP, and X is this smash over the torus of HFP. M is this um, mapping space, which should detect Vn, and B is... Uh, Kant's um, B operator. So I start, well, these are ring spectra, so in the zeroth uh, homology I have an uh, element one. And X, well, Vn acts trivially on X, because after all this is an HFP module. So one comes from, well here, downwards, I have planted um, well, here you see Kn, and there's the Vn map, which is a periodic or self map from a suspension down to Kn and then to uh, the Eilenberg McLean spectrum, and then this is the boundary map. So here I have smashed my x with this sequence here. And as I said, x is an uh, FP, uh, FP module, so the boundary map here is trivial, so one comes from something called tau n bar, I call it. And um, then I can take b of that, then I naturally get b of tau n bar, lives here. Uh, but b is a differential, so it will, take, um, it will take 1 to 0. So that means that bn goes to 0 here, so it means that it comes from here, so it comes from a class up here. Um, well, naturally, then it maps to a class over there. That's good. So uh, there's the class here, and I want to say that that is actually divisible by Vn. Well, that is good, because, well, what did I know? I knew that Rn goes to Rn, uh, and Rn goes to B tau n, which comes from here, so it goes to zero there. So Rn goes to zero there, so yay, it's divisible by Vn. The only problem you might have is that uh, Rn might be zero, which would be embarrassing. Uh, so uh, I would have shown you the slide if it were the case. Okay, so this is uh, where um, you actually have to do some work. Uh, you have to sit down and you have to calculate this thing here. And you have to understand enough of it so that you see that little rn does not ha doesn't have a chance to be b of something. So you do that, you sit down and you calculate, and you see that um, you see that it doesn't. Little rn is not in the image of b, so rn is a non-zero element, it goes to zero there, so it is vn of something. So vn cannot be zero. Actually, it is Vn of, uh, of a unit in uh, Kn, uh, Kn not of n. Um, so the only thing I haven't told you now is how you calculate uh, iterated uh, topological Hochschild homology of Fp, and we turn out to be very good at calculating these things now. Um, so you should think of, um, well, this smash power of Tn that will be just iterated topological Hochschild homology. But you should really feel free to change uh, Tn to any space. And then this is like uh, singular homology. Uh, singular homology has values in abelian groups with coefficients in something. And this is like singular homology in uh, commutative ring spectra of whatever space it's in here. So in order to calculate singular homology, you need to know the attaching maps. 
And uh, of course, you have to do that here as well. Um, the fascinating thing here is that, um, well, how do you make the two torus? For the two torus, you start with a one skeleton, and then you add a cell. And this is the commutator map. And out comes the torus. So this is the commutator map. And um, that map, of course, is a highly non-trivial map. But uh, it turns out that when I take the smash of this diagram, so this diagram is a push-out diagram, and I take the smash over this diagram, I get a push-out diagram in commutative ring spectra, this map here is as trivial as it can be. Um, that is not obvious. So it actually, in, that, in this situation here, yeah, let me explain that. So this is not infinite as in, is in infinity categories. Um, so that means that this thing here is a ring map. So it can't be any worse than actually factoring through uh, the ground ring. And that it does. So we actually get a full calculation of this thing here. You just sit down and you calculate. And at this stage, it is fairly easy, uh, but it gets more complicated as it, um, as it continues on. And let me mention at this stage that you might be tempted into saying that, well, the end torus if I just suspend it once, then that falls apart into the suspension of um, spheres, one for every subset of 1 to n. So these two things are the same. So you might think that THH of the torus should always be THH of such a wedge. And when I smash it, uh, when I take smash powers over this, the wedge be just becomes smashes, preserves coproducts. That is not the case. There are examples. So for HFP, it works perfectly fine, but it depends on what ring you're working with. So there are examples of rings where it is not true that even if you have an equivalence of suspensions, that will not have anything to say of um, the smashes over the spaces themselves. Unless, of course, it's induced by a map from this, between the spaces, then it will be okay. Was that clear? Okay, but in this situation, um, things are turn out to be maximally good because um, H, uh, HFP is so nice so that actually the torus falls apart into the wedge of spheres. You just see each in particular cell, and these BSX, well, you've seen them before. There are, of course, of course uh, there are... Um, smashes over spheres, but you can calculate them very concretely. You can write them do down in terms of generators and relations. Um, and so B1 is the polynomial ring. So this is the calculation of Buxted. Uh THH of FP is the polynomial ring. So there you have periodicity. 
And from there on, Bn is then just the tor of the previous B over Fp itself. And you can calculate these things. So they just fall. So you can think of the tor spectral sequence. There are no differentials in the tor spectral sequence. And uh, what is cool about this is that, of course, this is exactly the calculation uh, that Cartan does in order to calculate the homology of eilenberg McLean spaces. And it's exactly the same answer, except that the degree of the classes are off. But otherwise, it's exactly the same thing. So uh, ideally, what I'd like to say is that you prove it in the following way. You observe that you have this splitting of suspensions. So you have uh, a splitting of the smash over the suspension in terms of smash over spheres. Then you get to exactly this situation. And, um, well, the suspension of the torus is the suspension of the torus. So I have a cofibration sequence Tn into a contractible space into suspension of Tn. So I get a Greenlee spectral sequence from the Tn and uh, the suspension converging to the smash over a contractible space. So that's just an FP. So there is a lot of carnage going on here. So if even if I don't know the homotopy groups over the torus, I know these fellows, and I need to be able to account for all of them. All of them have to die. So that builds um, up the homotopy groups of this thing here. Of course, the story is slightly more complicated, but it's only slightly more complicated. Um, and then you get the result up here. There is, no, there is no option but this thing here being true. And once you have that, then you're uh, totally okay. Then you have that the original class um, couldn't be B of anything, so Vn had to be uh, non-trivial. So we know, even though we don't know the redshift conjecture, and we totally sure what the redshift conjecture should say. Um, we do know that um, K-theory of complicated spectra like iterated K-theory have interesting chromatic behavior at any stage. Knowing that these are not just non-zero but non-zero divisor is a much harder task that we are not equal to answering at the moment. But we're trying. Okay, so there are non some things that I have not touched upon that we perhaps should have. We have not discussed negative K theory. So it's a fact that um, it's a fact that K theory is sensitive to things being regular or not. It's of course related to what I said about K theory not being very nice re with respect to singularities. Uh, but of course, sort of one of the reasons I haven't talked that much about it is that TC is even more uh, hair-wired with, with respect to uh, singular things in this sense here. So it's not always that you get that much, but occasionally you do get, you do get something out of uh, topological cyclic homology. Motivic homotopy theory, obviously a lot to do there still. Um, and the original holy grail for many of us, k theory of spaces, well, there is a lot more to be said about that. I'm sorry for not having touched upon that. Isomorphism conjectures, well, uh, Veritsko uh, touched upon that before. If we want to understand the k theory of group rings, then we certainly shouldn't just be satisfied with having uh, the assembly map of the sort I displayed for the Novikov conjecture. We should except that we perhaps should assemble groups from more fascinating things than the trivial subgroup. <sighs> okay, number five here is close to my heart. Um, what are the natural operations and symmetry for K-theory? Uh, Clark Barwick has occasionally talked uh, very interestingly about that, uh, but I don't think we yet know what sort of answer we should expect here. So. This, of course, goes beyond saying that uh, in the discrete case, commutative rings, we have lambda rings, a lambda ring structure on, on K-theory, which comes from um, taking um, 
com comes from uh, operations ring ring uh, operations in in the module uh, modules of the uh, commutative ring um, what should that be in in uh, in higher situations so that is interesting for instance if you start discussing things like two vector bundles and stuff like that where you have some sort of geometric control you understand what it's doing you have your hands on your category um, you should be perhaps able to understand what the next layer should be and uh, perhaps Clark is right with what the story how the story should go on <sighs> well you have Galois theory descent brave new algebraic geometry we have used some of the words. Uh, we haven't really uh, done anything serious about it. Uh, we've talked about seven, and we have really uh, not done anything about involutions, but I know the rest of this, um, the conference is all about them, so let me stop there. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes. But otherwise, I couldn't iterate it. But uh, so, but of course, you couldn't. You didn't need to be as greedy as having in the entire GLNZ, the symmetric group inside it sits inside there. Of course, it doesn't. Uh, so, a, a, so I agree with you totally. There is no such the, uh, uh, symmetry on iterated K theory. Um, but it might be a. Okay, so there might be a useful halfway house where you do have some of this symmetry, but not all of it. So it wouldn't be the modules of the modules of the modules, but it would be some, some sort of N modules that had this sort of symmetry that were intermediate so between. Mm-hmm. So you you don't have the TN action at all on K theory, uh, and you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, on the cyclic K theory. No, okay. So so it would have to be another theory. I agree. I'd like to talk to you about it. I'm sorry. It's. Yes, that is clear. There is no chance for anything more. Uh, at, at least, uh, so let's, okay, let me not give a blanket yes in all cases, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there, there, y I, I, can, I can think of, uh, I can think of uh, uh, questions that could be phrased e uh, the same way where the answer, I guess, would be no, where I don't know. Yeah. It is. Oh, sorry. It's a factorization of knowledge. Ah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so I, I don't worry about that. No, no. So, so this thing here works for uh, for any space. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. It, it, it definitely it is commutative. Everything here is uh, when I do this is commutative.
Okay, so I don't know that much about factorization homology, so I probably should leave that to people who know factorization homology. Nobody knows factorization homology? <laughs> mm. 